Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Zero Hour Squared Classics, Current Classics. The next guest I have to present to you is somebody who I've admired for a very, very long time from one of my all-time favorite bands. So it's kind of weird when you interview one of your all-time favorite bands because you've you got that little bit of fandom going, but please forgive me. By the way, I'm your host, Mike Trujillo, and joining me today from the Cro-Mags, uh, one of the original two founders, Paris Mayhew, along with Harley Flanagan at the time, I'm guessing, was the other founding member of the Cro-Mags. Paris, thank you for taking the time uh, and joining us on the Zero Hour Squared Classics on a, on a Sunday during the pandemic and all that other crazy stuff. I really do appreciate it. How are you holding up so far? Um, well, thank you, Mike. Um, I'm holding up really well. To me, this is basically a prolonged summer vacation with with pay, I guess. But uh, you know, I, I work in the I work in the film business as a cameraman. I usually work 13, 14 hours a day, five days a week for the past 20 years. So this is kind of like a like like someone grabbed me out of my seat and shook me and was like, "There is a, there are other things to do." like things around the house and spend time with my wife and play music and things of that nature. Right, right. That's cool. And I, I want to talk to you a little bit about your film work and such a little bit later on, but I hear you uh, exactly what you're saying. Prior to the pandemic, I was working three jobs, all media related. I was doing camera work at a casino. I was doing security work at a venue, one in which you played here several decades ago, actually. And I do uh, radio, sports talk radio as my regular day job here in Albuquerque. So, I was around people all the time, and I'll be honest with you, I, I don't like the circumstances by which we've got this break, but I needed a little bit of decompression, and so far, you know, it, it's helping, but then there's times I, I get bored, man, and I have to go back to all those old shows, and I was watching a video that I recorded of the Cro-Max when you came through town, it was about 2000, uh, for the Revenge Tour. And I watched the whole thing, man. That was a great, great show, man. I, I, it was really cool. I'll have to send you a copy of it. Um, the video was a little not not so great. It was an old SVH camera. I probably had a couple of beers, so I was shaky. But um, yeah, the sound was good. The only thing, the, sound, the audio, the, the, the sound guy had killed uh, Harley's vocals for the first song or two. So that kind of sucked. But once it got going, it was really, really cool. That might be a good thing. <laughs> and by the way, that night you autographed my my Age of Coral CD, so I thank you for that. But um, you know, let, let's take it back all that way. Um, we hear a lot from from the two splits of the Cro-Mags and the Cro-Mags JM, obviously John and Mackie. But from your perspective, how did you guys? How did you end up being one of the founding members of the Cro-Mags? How did that whole whole thing start for you? Um. Well, I was. I had. I had a little band, you know, like a high school band. I mean, I, I know that sounds funny, because, but we were really, we really were kids when we started the Cro-Mags. I had a little high school band and, um, and, you know, we loved Rush and Van Halen and Aerosmith and all that kind of stuff. And that's, you know, we were writing original material. I didn't, I never to this day don't know how to play music by the people I pick up. I mean, I'm the hugest Led Zeppelin fan, Kiss fan. And I never ever picked up my guitar to play Stairway to Heaven. It just never, appeal to me also had some kind of weird thing that I thought if I knew how to play the songs they would wear down in my mind and I wouldn't enjoy them as much so back then I was writing songs that to me were like Rush or Van Halen or whatever and I had this band called Reported Missing and there was this kid in the band named Paul Dordal and uh, he was just like this crazy kid who would just go out to clubs when we were like 15 and 14 and hang out and he saw all these other things and he introduced me to Motorhead and around the same time I got introduced to the Sex Pistols. And when I heard Motorhead and the Sex Pistols, I was like, wow, you don't have to be Eddie Van Halen or Steve Howe to make music. Like you didn't have to be this virtuoso. Um, you could just sit down and cobble together songs that were, that were really cool that moved people because the Sex Pistols and Motorhead were moving me just as much as Van Halen and Rush. And, Yes, and all these people that I thought had to be like supernatural beings to play music. So I started writing different kind of music. And uh, that guy, Paul, he, he, he split from the band and he started hanging around it, you know, with different people. And then one day I ran into him on the street and he was with Harley and I was putting up flyers, like musicians wanted flyers. At the time I was playing bass and it said like bassists look for, looking for musicians to start band type thing. And Paul and Harley walked up while I was putting up the flyers and uh, 
Paul introduced us, even though I knew who Harley was because he was in a band called The Stimulators, which I had already started to go see and like. And uh, so I was well aware of him. And uh, Harley said something to Paul like, oh, you know, why don't you play with Paris? And he said, uh, he goes, well, I, I'm not good enough. Paris plays like Rush and all this other stuff. And uh, like really gave me a big push as, you know, an anomaly on the punk rock scene, which because I actually knew how to play my instrument. But um, so we went right over to uh, Harley's Aunt Denise's house. Harley's Aunt Denise was the, the guitarist of the Stimulators, amazing guitarist and a great songwriter and all those good things. And she had like this apartment on Lower East Side. And I don't know why, but she had a bunch of equipment uh, that belonged to Black Flag. Uh, like a big S Marsh, uh, uh, Ampeg SVT cabinet that said black flag, you know, I had the black flag logo on the side. And I was like, Oh my God, this is, you know, I'm not just hanging out with Denise from the stimulators, but, uh, I'm going to play bass on a, uh, on a black flag amp. And I just seen black flag, you know, play at the mud club and they were just incredible. But, um, maybe that's why the equipment was there. But, uh, so I plugged in a bass and I just started playing riffs of, songs that I had just written, like what you might call my new batch of music that was set, you know, I had kind of moved away from my ambitions to be like Rush and was, was basically trying to write songs like Motorhead because I, because that was something I could understand. You know, I could understand Rush, but I could never play like Geddy Lee, even today, you know, those kinds of players, uh, there's something magical and uh, mystical about their abilities, but, um, so I sat down and I, and I cobbled out these songs and one of the first songs was World Peace. I'll just stick with the song World Peace because all those riffs were written and I played them right there for, for Harley and Denise. And while I was playing them, it was like the oddest phenomenon because they started talking about me as if I wasn't sitting there. You know, like as if I was like, you know, they, like they were having this conversation amongst themselves. Oh, this is really good, you know. Uh, you know and Denise said to him, Harley, this 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 could be really this really could be a band. You know, this could be a band. And I was like, you know, I'm sitting here. <laughs> but anyway, I, th I played a couple other songs. I think I played "Life of My Own" in the in the in the riffs for "It's the Limit," which were all like, you know, I I, I often say like sometimes if you sit down with a guitar and you play like "World Peace," "It's the Limit," you know, "Signs at a Times." It's almost like the right hand never stops moving. You just got to change the notes on the left hand. It's just like one continuous aspiration of lemminess, you know. Because I, I really, what, to a large extent, like you know, I had this imprint in my mind of what music should be from listening to Rush and all the chord progressions that they played. And if you lit, and I, it's funny. I was I was explaining this to Roy Mayorga recently, a drummer, because we were jamming at his house, and I was saying, you know. You, you would build the, you know, like people talk about the pentatonic box and all that stuff. That never meant anything to me. But to me, for me, I had imprinted on my brain was these these shapes that Rush always played. Like in the song uh, Bastille Day, it goes bam, 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 bam. So I had that shape in my mind. And then that became both the riff for the We Got a No intro and Malfunction. And it's exactly the same shape. And then some of the shapes from Bastille Day are the same chord shapes as World Peace. Now, they're, 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 they bear no other resemblance but the chord shapes. But, you know, that's how people build music. There's so many guitar players. You see the minute they pick up a guitar, guitar they play some kind of pentatonic box somewhere on the neck. And that's their point of reference. My point of reference was the Rush shapes. But anyway, those were the things I was playing for Denise and Harley. And then, um, and Paul was there with us. And so the idea was that we were going to start this band called the Bald Eagles. Because both Paul and Harley were obsessed with this whole idea of like having this young kid skinhead band. Harley actually wanted it to be like Menudo. I don't know if you guys know what Menudo oh, yeah. is, but in New York, everybody knew what Menudo was. It was like a band from Puerto Rico and you had, you had to be a kid. And if, once you got to be 16, you couldn't be in the band anymore. And Ricky Martin was like, you know, famous for being in that band. And Harley was like, we'll, we'll be like, we'll be like Menudo. And as soon as you turn 
16, well, except for Paris, you know, you get you have to leave the band and you have to have a skinhead. Well, I mean, except for Paris. And it, and it became like this laundry list of things you had to do to be in the band, except for Paris. Because like, I guess because I played like Rush or whatever and I, and I had these songs that I got a pass. I didn't have to shave my head or, uh, and I could be 17 because I was 17 at the time. Actually, no, I think I was 16 at the time and I was about to turn 17. But yeah, so me, Paul, and Harley were the original members of the band. And I, and I say the band because th there's been this myth created by Harley that he was forming the Cro-Mags. Um, and he did to a certain extent before I had started playing with him, or actually when I started playing with him, he had a band, a little band called the Cro-Mags. And they were about to play a gig. And he said to me, who was like, oh, by the way, I have this other band, and, but don't worry about it because, like, you know, the drummer's moving to Florida or something, and this guy's going to college or whatever, and it's just not working out. And it's called the Chrome Eggs, but we're going to play a gig. And we went to the gig together. It was at the Peppermint Lounge, and John Barry from the Beastie Boys, the original, one of the original members of the Beastie Boys who passed away recently, rest in peace, my brother, um, he sang. And uh, they played this gig, and it was real cool. And I loved it. And, uh, but you know, all during the time I was there with Harley, it was like, you know, that band's over, you know, our band is going to be the thing. And there was no presumption that it was going to be called Chrome Mags. It was, you know, gonna, it, it, we, he came up with like 10 million different names, the bald eagles and this and that, which I pray didn't work out, but there were many, many things discussed. So me, Harley and Paul jammed maybe twice before Paul kind of bowed out because Paul was playing guitar. And he, 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 it wasn't really his instrument. When I played with him, he was the singer. But he was giving playing guitar a, a, a shot, and I was playing bass. But uh, I guess he felt um, that he, his place wasn't in this band. So he just stepped out. And then literally for almost two years, Harley and I really couldn't find any other musicians to play with. So we just wrote songs. So we basically stockpiled songs for the Age of Quarrel. Um, and uh, we, we jammed with one or two people. Like We played with Dave Hahn, the drummer from Artless, who was also the manager of the Bad Brains for a while. We played with him once or twice. He, he, he seemed to have more of a business interest in us than, a, than, a, uh, than being a member of the band. I guess he just thought he'd give it a shot. And he came and jammed with us a couple of times, but, but it didn't really work out with him. He was also a heroin addict, so that, didn't, <laughs> that could be problematic. And he passed away. Rest in peace, my brother. Um, so me and Harley just continued writing songs and we wrote songs until about maybe two years. And maybe, I guess we started in 81 and sometime in the middle of 83 or, you know, it was a long time ago. I'm not really sure. We, we enlisted uh, our friend Eric Casanova and as a singer. And, but by this time I had switched to guitar and Harley had switched to bass and, uh, and Eric basically just listened to all these songs we had and he sat down in his little school notebook that he had and he wrote Life of My Own, Hard Times, Survival of the Streets, Street Justice. I mean, you might even call what that 14, 15 year old kid scrawled into his notebook, the Cro-Mags Manifesto. I mean, all the, all the ideals and uh, mottos that people think that the chrome egg stood for back there were really penned by eric and then we got mackie in the band and and that was the band at first it was eric casanova me harley and mackie and then um and somewhere along the line eric got his 24 year old girlfriend pregnant joined the harry krishna temple and disappeared so we had to replace him and john joseph was another guy that was around you know it's also gonna understand the hardcore scene was so small. It was puny. It was pitiful in New York. Not really pitiful. It was actually wonderful. I, I take that back. It was a really small collective of uh, like-minded, artistic, young kids in the street. You know, the drinking age was 18 and no one was checking for IDs. So in New York, if you were 15 years old and you could play an instrument, you could put together a band and play a club in New York City. And because of that, um, there um, developed this youth music culture that under normal circumstances couldn't exist because you normally have to be of drinking age to play in a nightclub. 
So all these young kids were playing in the clubs. And uh, so, yeah, we, we, uh, we got John into the band and he basically just sang all of the, the lyrics that Eric had already penned, except for It's the Limit. It, it's the Limit was called Kill the Ayatollah or something goofy like that. At the time, it was like the time of the, sh the Ayatollah Khomeini and the Shah of Iran were all in the news. So they had, he had this goofy song called Kill the Ayatollah, which I guess John wouldn't sing, but uh, he changed the lyrics to that. And Harley had already written the lyrics to World Peace, which was the first song I introduced to the band, which was r really the first Chromag song. And I guess it, along around this time, it was you know time to play gigs. And uh, so, you know, that was when we first started gigging, me, John, Mackie. Actually, what am I talking about? We did two gigs with Eric. We played two CBGB shows with Eric singing before he had to leave the band, which is a shame. I wish some of the, I wish we had recorded the original demo with him because as after all, they were his songs. And people ask all the time, oh, did you ever record anything with Eric? But unfortunately, we didn't. So that's the beginning. Yeah, I like that. That's a great beginning because there's so many avenues and tentacles that are going to weave off from that. First off, you know, growing up here in the Southwest, I've lived here in Albuquerque all my life and I'm 50 years old now. So when I was introduced to y'all, it was around 87 when, when uh, The Age of Coral pretty much came out or had been out maybe a year or so or two, whatever the case may be. So I'm a metal kid that loves punk and hardcore. I kind of started out obviously with um, you know bands like Queen, you know listening to my sister's collection of music, then ACDC, Black Sabbath, the whole you know Venom, you know all that stuff. Rush, Rush is my favorite band by the way. So I'm I'm glad you also mentioned them. That's incredible. Um, that's been yeah. seen yeah. Rush 15 times. Yeah, I've seen them third. before Moving Pictures came out. Oh, see, I, and I didn't see them till after Moving Pictures. I was just a little bit too young, but again. For me and a lot of my friends growing up here in the Southwest, the New York hardcore scene was this like grandiose, like that is the scene. You know, I had a lot of um, connections to Los Angeles, but that was more thrash metal. A lot of like bands like uh, Dark Angel and Insecticide and bands like that, Agent Steel. Whereas the New York hardcore scene really spoke to us, to me, um, as far as the crossover movement and how crucial that was. And, you know, some of the bands that were in and around that time with you guys, Murphy's Law, Lee Way, Agnostic Front, all of that whole scene, we were like just taken aback by it. And we were like, that's the pinnacle. That's where we got to be. And so that seemed to me, I mean, still to this day is absolutely one of the best movements of music that ever happened, particularly in heavier music and hardcore. And you guys were right in the thick of things. And with The Age of Coral, I consider that the definitive hardcore album. I know maybe a lot of people tell you that. I know maybe a lot of people disagree. But to, uh, in my opinion, the short songs, the speed, the aggression, the sociopolitical type of lyrics that you guys were putting, it, it was like the Bible of hardcore. At least that's how I viewed it. And that's why um, I still to this day revere it and I never get tired of it. I can listen to it day in, day out and still find something new about it. That's fantastic. Um, I mean, all those things, none of those are for me to say, um, except for this whole, uh, you know, I, I, I know about the whole crossover phenomenon. Um, and and how they attribute um, our second album, Best Wishes, to playing some kind of role in that, which I find humorous because they must not have ever listened to Age of Quarrel because Seekers of the Truth and Malfunction are on that album and they're clearly metal songs. Um, but to me, they're just songs. You know, when, when, when me and Harley met in 81 or whatever it was, um, and we started talking about forming a band there was no term hardcore um or maybe it was 1980 because i remember when me and paul Dordal, the guy who we, we actually started the band uh we would talk you know like we'd have those goofy kid conversations like are we punk rock or are we this and i was like I, I would just say listen you know i'm sorry i don't really understand what you're talking about i don't identify that with that any of those things, you know, where I grew up in the Bronx, if you got called a punk, that was the worst thing you could possibly be called. So I certainly don't identify with being a punk. Um, I understand that the, that the word is taken on a different connotation as a musical genre and all that stuff, but you can't erase it. It's like saying that the swastika doesn't mean Nazis and, uh, or something like that in my book. 
but uh, but I didn't, I, you know, as a, as a kid, even then, I didn't really identify with this idea like I'm this or I'm that. To me, they were just songs that I was writing that I really liked. And I loved punk rock. I loved the Sex Pistols, but I certainly didn't understand why they called themselves punks and all that kind of stuff. It, you know, I know I understand it was that street punk thing, but the connotations were just something I never really understood. Um, so this whole idea when, you know, when... When we put, when we were getting ready to put out Age of Quarrel, and, and, and it became suddenly, we became um, accessible to press, and then they, the press are the ones who really come up with these things to call us, so they, you know, so they know what they're talking about, so they can put things, you know, people, you know, categorical thinking is how people uh, are more willing to accept things. So if you put something in a category, it's all, like, it's all really good. Um, all that aside, I never really thought of ourselves as hardcore or metal uh i thought we were whatever motorhead was i you know i that's really when i listened to motorhead record it encompassed you know everything that i thought i could understood uh, understand and translate into music uh, myself and uh really like it and feel like i'd done something uh, worthwhile category aside uh, if, if we want to talk about the other bands that came out that did this crossover thing um, Definitely more deliberately we could talk about carnivore because Pete Steele was like he was this Bizarre kind of musical sponge. He was just such a fan of music that Literally, you know, he was like a shiny object guy like if something went by that was shiny, he would like reach out and grab it. And, and if he liked it, he would embrace it and it would somehow become part of his outfit. You know, when I first met him, he was the thermonuclear warrior, you know, wearing fur and pads. And he's saying, you know, about like <laughs> making love on the fur and, you know, eating people and stuff like that. And then, you know, then, you know, I don't really know how it happened, but I know we were playing a hardcore matinee and Carnivore was playing a metal night, a Sunday metal night, which I would, which was seemed like the craziest thing. You know, you talked about New York being hardcore being this kind of mecca. It, it really was fantastic. I mean, I, I oftentimes look back and think to myself, how could it have been possible that we were all friends, that we all hung out on street corners and bars together when nobody, he was famous, you know, Adam Yauch from the Beastie Boys and, uh, you know, Kamal from the Jerky Boys was one of our pals that hung out with us every night. Uh, all these, the guys from White Zombie, Rick Rubin, you know, all these people that went on, you know, the guys, I mean, I, I don't, I don't want to leave out such a persistent and successful band as Agnostic Front and Murphy's Law and all that kind of stuff. We all used to just sit in on a park bench it, on, in winter nights, burning the wood from the park benches in a garbage can to, and hang out and drink beers night after night after night. Uh, and it was such, like, if I could go to that place right now, I would go. <laughs> I wish I could go and exchange ideas. Like, I didn't even know we were exchanging musical ideas. I didn't even know we were having this push and pull competition that I wrote better songs because I was hanging out with Jimmy Stoppo and I wrote better songs because, you know, Harley Flanagan would show up with his bass and play something for me. I'd go, Ooh, that's really good. And then I'd be like, I gotta play something better. And then somebody like Pete Steele comes along and we were playing this matinee and we headlined, so we were hot shit, you know, sold out show after the show. We're like taking our time getting off the stage. And the metal bands started sound checking while we were clearing out our backstage. And, uh, you know, you hear dum, 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 like, uh, and my friend Sean Taggart, uh, who was my friend at the time, uh, and an artist of you no, know, he did like Carnivore's first two album covers and Prong's album cover. Oddly enough, he did Carnivore's album cover about the story I'm about to tell you. But he was like, let's get out of here. This horrible metal band is about to sound check. And I was like, oh, you know, this girl and blah, blah, blah. I got to hang out backstage, whatever. And uh, finally, he, he's literally dragging me by the shirt in my guitar case and we get out in front of the stage. CBGB's had the, the, the dressing rooms are right underneath the stage, kind of right behind the stage. So you come out of this dressing room that doesn't have a door. And then you just walk around this like stage. It's only about, you know, foot and a half off the ground. And uh, just as we're coming around the edge of the stage, this band that's on stage, just they just drop this first chord. 
<laughs> I mean, I don't know what song it was, but it was probably World Wars three and four or something from the first Carnival album. But it was just like a, a, a funeral. It was like a funeral march. And it was just, it was almost like a, like a dump truck got dropped out of the sky. <laughs> that first chord was so fucking heavy. I felt it. I was like, oh my God. And I turned around and I look up and I see Pete fucking Steele standing there. And this was like pre-muscles and everything, but he was still like 96 feet tall and, you know, made his bass look like it was this big. And this sound was coming off the stage and it was just three guys and Sean is pulling on my shirt. I'm just like, and I'm thinking to myself, how are you not hearing what I'm hearing? And it was just, it was uh, mysterious because I couldn't figure out what I was listening to because I never heard bands tuned down. I mean, I guess we all knew Black Sabbath tuned down, but that was, that was it. There was no sound guard and there was no, none of all these, like this whole wave of bands that came afterwards. And I bet you guys from like Kurt Winstead from uh, Crowbar and stuff would testify that to a large extent, uh, Carnivore played a role in, transitioning all those bands into tuning differently but anyway i was looking at his bass i'm looking at the pedals i'm looking at the cabinets and i'm trying to figure out what is it that's making it sound like this you know because i didn't know that it was a tuning and sean was pulling on me and pulling on me and screaming at the top of his lungs, let's get the fuck out of here and i just stood there and i was like no and then sean finally left and i stood there and i waited for them to finish their first song and and i guess the first song ended you know, whatever it was, 15 minutes later, one of those like epic long songs. And I'm still like looking at everything. And then like kind of in my peripheral vision, I could see this hand like, you know what I mean? <laughs> if, you, if you could see my hand, it like, it just like this gigantic hand came into my view. And I looked up and it was Pete and he was going, what's up? My name's Pete. <laughs> I reached up and my like little my little hand fitted his hand. And he shook my hand. And I was like, I'm Paris. And he goes, Excellent set today. I said, Thank you very much. And it was only at that moment that I looked down and saw he was wearing a Chromex t shirt. Nice. The one we had that we sold at the show that day. And he was like, It's good to meet you. And then he just went back to his business. And then uh, we became friends after that and he was another one of those people that i could list to of these extraordinary folks that we all nobody knew about us and we were all friends and we all found each other and i still find that so fascinating and bizarre that i could walk, walk from one bar on one street corner hanging out with yauk from the beastie boys and pass harley on the way to Blanche's and then sit down with Pete Steele at, uh, at King Tut's Wawa Hut, you know, sitting across the street from, the, or getting served a drink from the bass player from Blitzbeer and uh, Jimmy Gestapo is doing the door. And uh, it was just a particularly rich um, little scene in, in and to, to an extent that I don't even really understand it. Like, it's funny because, like, you know, now, nowadays there's all these rock and roll bars in New York or whatever, and I go to them, and I think to myself, wow, I'm going to go sit at the bar, and, like, that guy over there might be this great singer, and that guy might be Pete Still, and that guy might be Jimmy Gestapo. Yeah, but none of them are. Yeah, I was going to ask you, fast forward to today's music, and, and I guess oversaturation not enough originality. There's good, really good bands, and there's some great artists. None of them, though, in reinventing the wheel by no means. You know, there was the, the little thrash movement where a whole bunch of thrash bands came out and were just, ex just doing exactly what the bands of the 80s were doing. So there was nothing new, phenomenal, or even remotely interesting to listen to. Whereas in hardcore, though, I've had a hard time finding... Uh, and almost in every genre of, of heavy rock and metal, it's it, these days it's very hard to find good new stuff. There is some good new stuff, like I said, really, really good stuff, but I'm finding I'm hard pressed to find the innovativeness of that time period. Maybe I'm stuck, stuck a little bit, but man, like you said, what, what that New York hardcore scene represented was every bit as important as, as you know, the, uh, the, the, the British movement in music, the, you know, the uh, San Francisco Haight-Ashbury scene, Laurel Canyon in Los Angeles, 
all these bands, like you said, hanging together, yeah. communing, communing together and, and uh, bouncing ideas. And then suddenly you have them all successful at one crazy time. You mentioned typo negative, prong, um, you know, Anthrax was in it, in it about that whole thing, being named one of the big four. Uh, I remember New Jersey, you brought up Shan, uh, Sean Taggart and uh, um, what was the band, uh, Whiplash. You know, some, so many of those bands intercrossed and interspersed. And I thought that movement was absolutely crucial if you were somebody like me who loved the heaviness of metal but loved some of the message, the more real message, say, above and beyond what early uh, black and death metal bands kind of did, kind of got war on me. I got kind of out of the demon phase, more into like screw the, uh, the system phase, if you will. So that leads me to where Age of Quarrel is and where, like I said, it's sort of the definitive Bible of hardcore, not just musically, but the socio-political uh, messages. Um, you also mentioned a former member being into the Hare Krishna movement. And that was kind of one of those things that we thought as a, as a, as a myth when we were out here and we we're like, hey, did you guys know the Cro-Mans were on Christian? Really? What? That's crazy. That's cool. So kind of speak to us about some of those myths about the cro and tell us about the uh, lead into about the Age of Coral and, and how I, I, I consider it to be, like I said, the definitive hardcore album. Um, I, know well, I just want to mention one, two, two other people that I totally forgot were just part of like daily life was I used to go shoot pool at this pool hall on Avenue A called Blanche's during the day uh, to practice, you know, for nighttime. And uh, I always shot, used to shoot pool in there with Earl from the Bad Rains. And, uh, and then you could just go across the street and HR would be wandering around the park, uh, reading the Bible out loud, like a, <laughs> like a lunatic. But uh, he would stop uh, if you came up and said hello. Again, to imagine that just is like something I can't believe. Um, and I, and I, and I started to talk about Pete, I'll go, I'll go back to that, uh, age of coral question, but I wanted to talk about the Pete thing, which was, uh, about him being like so easily influenced. Cause like I said, he was the thermonuclear nuclear warrior, but he, he came and saw us play at CBGB's. And the next thing you know, he started showing up to, uh, hardcore shows. And, um, one day I looked up and there's this like gigantic skinhead standing there. And I looked at it and I was like, oh my God, that's Pete. And he just one day showed up and he was a hardcore guy, like transformed 100% overnight, fully committed. <laughs> and combat boots. And I just stood there looking at him and thinking this is very peculiar. But then he just became another guy that was hanging out. And then <clears throat> to my astonishment, they released the album Retaliation. And what the fuck? That was the greatest fucking album. Uh, I could put it in a list of my top 10 favorite albums of all time. I mean, the album is a monster. It's a work of art. It's brutal. It's poetic. It's a masterpiece. And he, Pete, immediately, you know, upon questioning, you know, was completely unapologetic. I don't think anybody, you know, would ever have, if anybody else like was one day this thermal nuclear warrior and then the next day showed up being a hardcore kid, they might get criticized for being a poser or whatever. But Pete lived it. I mean, he immersed himself and he did it for one reason. The one reason we all were there, although many people don't even that word doesn't come to their mouth the first time when people are asked. I remember there was a whole show on Phil Donahue about hardcore and they interviewed 50 kids in the audience. And every, every time Phil Donahue was like, why are you, you know, what, tell me about hardcore and what it's all about. And, they were, and Ray Bees was like, well, it's a sociopolitical and um, working class and blah, blah, blah. No, it was about the music. And that's why Pete transformed. <clears throat> He transformed because of the music. Every one of those kids on that TV show, they missed the fucking point. None of us would have been there if it wasn't for the Bad Brains and Stimulators and Kraut and Black Flag and Circle Jerks and Dead Kennedys and Misfits and all those bands. It was because there was this magic that was happening. I mean, just those bands that I just listed, the Dead Kennedys, Bad Brains, Black Flag, what do they have in common? Nothing. They're nothing alike. 
this whole idea, you know, like they're all called hardcore bands, Minor Threat to all the great bands that from that era were, are called hardcore bands, right? The beginning of hardcore. But you couldn't pinpoint what aspects, what attributes to each one of those groups makes them that, except for that we were all in the audience watching them. Every, band, every one of those band members was in every other band's audience watching them and participating. And, and, and somehow, I guess, like I, you know, like I said, when I was having my initial conversation with Paul, you know, he, he, is it punk rock? Is it this? Oh, you know, and then he said something about hardcore. That was the first time I ever heard it. To me, that was, all that's irrelevant. It, it's the music. And the, the phenomenon that made hardcore what it was at the time was this explosion of creativity that necessarily wasn't related in a genre it was just this kind of like like-minded wanting to do something completely different but play it really fast and hard and great and that's what everybody did and um so pete's transformation to me seemed pure because his motivation was the source was the music and he made this one record, and like the first Carnivore record was a flop. Second Carnivore record was a flop. Um, by any standards, I mean, at the time, it, it wasn't enough to m maintain a life of being a musician for Pete. He worked at the parks department. Uh, he was like a head of a park. And, uh, and Louis uh, was a bus driver. And uh, they had these union jobs and they were very secure and, and, and happy with that. Not happy with it, but in their neighborhood, having those kinds of jobs was, uh, were, they were desirable. They were sought after, you know, having benefits and taking care of your family and having, you know, <coughs> a secure life. That's what you would do if you weren't Pete Steele. But he was Pete Steele. And uh, so Carnivore broke up and then he ended up doing this other band repulsion and i think the rule i think he said at the time but the rule to be in the band was you have to live on my block and you have to agree to never go on tour you know so they and then, so they put out this record that was somewhere between industrial you know like i guess he heard industrial music and then he was like okay i'll make this album and it, again you know the transformation was pure it was like his love of that kind of music and some kind of weird kind of drift towards plush you know the band lush yeah lush and my bloody Valentine and whatever he was listening to, to at the time. Flop, another flop, you know, blows like the wind flop. But then he discovers this Gothic thing and he does bloody kisses and he has success, huge success, platinum success. And then he never changed. He was no longer attracted by shiny objects. he found something. Could you imagine putting out uh, retaliation and nobody responding? Yeah. That's Even flow deep and hard and nobody responding. Right. Then you put out bloody kisses and I'm like, oh, this is what I, this is what I can do. And, that's, and he stuck with that until the day he died. And with all due respect to bloody kisses and October rust, there's nothing like retaliation. There's nothing like even slow, deep and hard. And I had a lot of interactions with him. I interviewed him for fanzines and for my old public access show a couple of times. Man, one of the most gracious and, and cool characters you're ever going to meet, but very, very deep for sure. And um, I guess esoteric would be the best word to describe him, you know, just kind of outside of the box. I kind of consider that the same thing of Harley Flanagan. Would you say that that's kind of the same assessment with him, that he's outside of the box, a little bit uh, out there here and there, uh, uh, eccentric sometimes to a fault to a point where it's kind of like eh, all right enough but at the same time you love him for what he is um they're very different um pete's not i didn't i don't think pete was particularly eccentric i mean he definitely put it on later on when he became famous but he wasn't like that uh, before that it wasn't like he was this eccentric nobody and then became a famous eccentric. I think that was the luxury of fame. You know, everything you feel, you feel deeper than anyone else type thing. You know, at least that's what the fans will 
<coughs> support. Um, so he became known that way, but he was, he, he wasn't that, I, I didn't see him that way. I, he definitely said things to try to make you laugh. Uh, Har Harley certainly does that too. They're both uh, extremely funny, oddly enough, but in different ways, but they, they both have the ability to grasp a social situation and uh, highlight certain aspects of it to crack you the fuck up. But uh, Harley's um, eccentricities extend to um, the less appealing. Um, but not less appealing in that, you know, like he's had a, a troubled life. Uh, I, Pete, I feel, had, you know, I think uh, I, I, maybe until the end of his life, I'm not sure where he lived at the end, but he lived in his, in the house with his parents. You know, he had a good family life and, uh, or seemed to love his family and was raised well. Although I must say regionally, uh, he has some of the regional attributes uh, that Brooklyn can impose upon you that maybe not that attractive, but wouldn't make him unusual. Uh, but um, yeah, that's about all I have to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean it to be a, an uncomfortable question, but it's just... No, no, it's interesting that you put them together because, yeah. you know... I think another one that I would be, and again, this is coming from me living in a Southwest town, I mean, very small. We just probably have a little over a million people. We're, we're finally known now a little bit more than we were back in the day, other than a place to cruise through Route 66, uh, the, the, the historic uh, highway. But uh, I would put maybe Vinny Stigma in there too. I mean, these guys were kind of larger than life and represented that scene. So everybody was aspired to be like that, whether that was the creation of their music or their attitude on stage or getting a tattoo on their chest, all big and bad, you know, those kinds of things. So I, I think from some degree from where we're at, we looked up at, at that scene kind of like the older brothers, like the guys that are doing it. And we want to emulate that. And I think that that's what made that scene so crucial and fun. I totally understand. Uh, Vinny Stigma for, is a great example. You know, he's, it's like I said, the, the, uh, the fact that all these people gravitated to each other, Vinny being one of those many characters, the Vinnies, the Jimmy Gestapos, I mean, they're like characters out of a book or a TV show or something. They're just, just peculiar characters. Like I remember going over to Vinny's house. He lived in this house in Little Italy, which I think, I assume he still lives in. I haven't spoken to him in a while. But, you know, as a kid, you know, Vinny was older than us. I, I mean, I remember when I first started going to clubs um, as a young teenager, maybe 14, like I said, you could get into clubs and stuff like that when you were a kid in New York. If you just, if the person standing at the front liked the way you looked for whatever reason, I guess showing up with a skateboard under my arm and short pants and sneakers was something <laughs> that allowed me in. But I used to go to these shows and I'd go to see the stimulators and the mad and, uh, and you know, whoever was happening at the time, I would just look in the Village Voice if the band sounded good, I'd go, oh. but the stimulators I went to see because of recommendations at school. There was this one group of punk rockers. There was like three guys that they always stood next to each other. They all wore leather jackets. They were kind of like Ramones type guys. And uh, I remember when I first heard the Sex Pistols at the Mud Club, I, I heard this music coming out of the speakers. You know, at this time it was like, 1979 or 80 and like what was on the radio was starting to dominate was like I mean I don't want to disparage Blondie because Blondie's great but uh suddenly you were just hearing Blondie and the cars and and, and and stuff like that on the radio and it seemed like rock and roll was just disappearing and the last holdout was Van Halen you know but they even they were turning, you know, their second album was like, oh, no, what happened? I mean, I love their second album now, but at the time it seemed very soft because Van Halen could have gone in two directions. They could have gone more atomic punk, run with the devil, or they could have gone more Jamie's crying. You know what I mean? Yeah. And they went Jamie's crying, right. which is great. But yeah, so there I was, you know, with this in my mind, because that's what else does a 14-year-old have in their mind, but like which way Van Halen's going? And uh, I heard this song. 
it was uh, Anarchy in the UK by the Sex Pistols, just blaring out of the speakers. And I was like, right now. I was like, oh my God, what is this? Chills, I'm getting chills now thinking about it. My wife would laugh at me. Um, and I just stood there listening to it like in astonishment at this voice and this music. And I was like, what is this? And I saw these like three punk rockers standing over in the corner. And I thought, they must know. So I walked up, I was like, hey, who is this song? And the guy looks down at me and goes, Sex Pistols, dick. <laughs> and I said, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. And I walked away and I was like, Sex Pistols. Went to school on Monday, went up to the three punk rockers and I said, hey. And they said, yeah. Looked at me basically the same way the three punk rockers at the club did. I said, uh, do you have a Sex Pistols album I could borrow? And he looks down at me and he goes, yes, yes I do. And the next day he brought in the Sex Pistols album and lent it to me. Nice. Yeah. That, that's, see, that's exactly how, how I grew up as well. And it's funny because I want to tell you a quick story about this one punk rocker here in town. Um, I, like I said, I never cut my hair. I always went with my rock shirts to the hardcore shows. I never got to mess with, though. They knew I loved the music. I got in the pit. I made a lot of friends, but I was never one of those guys. I know there was a lot of times skins would fight with the metalheads, punks would fight with the metalheads, vice versa, all, of, all, that, all that stuff happened. But for me, for whatever reason, I was just kind of left alone on my own devices, just jamming out. But this one punk rocker comes up to me, had spiky hair, he looked like Colin from GBH. And he mm -hmm. was tall, and he was in uh, grades older than me. He saw my vest and I had New York hardcore written in pin and I had a bunch of other pins of bands and a Ronald Reagan face crossed out and all this other stuff and he asked me what is New York hardcore or what does that mean on your shirt and I told him I said it's New York hardcore he says are you from New York and I'm like no and he says why the hell do you have that and I said well, because I like those fucking bands man I like that scene but he, he was trying to belittle me and kind of trying to put me in place and after that he never right. never brought it up but I mean there was a lot of that there was a lot of that kind of that hazing process, if you will, and kind of proving your point and proving who your worth and who you were. And, you know, I, I know that that was uh, um, around the whole country, whether you were in D.C., Seattle, Albuquerque, Tucson, or New York, you know, that was kind of kind of the process. But after that, I kind of felt a little more validated by, by not caving in too much. I didn't really have an answer. I just had New York hardcore there, the cross out, getting the cross and – and I, it was because I love the bands. And I, again, it was because all these artists so that you brought up, so many of them that we're talking about, including yourselves, were very impactful in, in our lives growing up out here, you know, in this dusty little town. And that's what brings me to Age of Coral. I had asked you that a little while ago, that the impact, what, how many years is it now? 20, 30 years old now, the album? Older than that, my math is not good. But it still holds up, and it's probably even that much more applicable today's uh, you know, happenings, you know, with the pandemic and the social political change that we're seeing, the social injustices being answered and all the crazy politics. I mean, we're basically living the age of quarrel right now. What, what, how do you think about that now? What, what's in your mind when you think what you guys created back then still holds the test of time now and it probably will another 30, 40 years from now? Well, I'm certainly proud of it and glad that you feel that way and, and others feel that way. I, 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 the, the, the only real concerted effort I ever made was to write the best songs I could uh, that appeal to me. You know, if, if I wrote something on my guitar and I went over to the squat or wherever Harley was living at the time or he came over to my house, depended different you know I would come out of school and sometimes Harley would be standing in front of my school scaring all the other kids with his shirt off <laughs> and then he'd be like let's go you know you know this was a daily thing then he would meet me at school because he wasn't going to school so he would just meet me at three o'clock and uh, we'd go either to my apartment which was close by or we would just walk down to the village go to a bar talk about all we do is talk about the band all we do is talk about music or jam and we didn't have anybody else to jam with so we would just play riffs all endlessly, endlessly, endlessly. So the buildup to making Age of Quarrel was, was just this ferocious 
vetting of riffs. You know, I would come in with a riff, he would come in with a riff, uh, and we would just play it to death and then add parts to it. And so literally, the, 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 almost the entire album was written before Eric came along, this, the first singer. So he had this, like, all this stuff. You know, you also got to understand, like, Eric wasn't a singer. If we hadn't asked him to sing for us, I don't know if he would have ever thought about being a singer. So this idea of writing lyrics, like taking out a notebook and writing it down, he didn't have a you know a how to. He didn't have anybody to ask advice. He just scrawled it all out and and did what he did by the seat of his pants, and, and it was great and perfect. And um, and 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 test. I can't really attest to that kind of stuff because I, I I certainly guide the lyrics like where I, where I wanted them to go or where I didn't want them to go. And that only really became a big issue when John joined the band because he tried to incorporate things into the lyrics that didn't speak to me. I mean, you got to understand for, for me, it was like I spent years putting this band together and writing the songs for my band. I said, I, every, every note that I wrote was for this band. I didn't aspire to be in 15 other bands. At the same time we were doing, when we were putting together Heart and uh, this band, Harley was playing drums with Murphy's Law. He played in another band with John Joseph and Doug. You know, he was like hedging his bets, playing with anybody and everybody, which never really bothered me because I really believed in what we were doing. And I didn't hear anybody doing anything like what we were doing in that room. That little bit of time that we would spend hours, you know, here and there, like every other day playing, to me, I was. Every time we play it, I was like, I wish I could go to a concert and hear something like this. The only band on the scene that made me nervous was the Crumb Suckers. You know, I felt like I felt like on the scene there was probably going to be only one band that like made it big, uh, and I thought it was going to be them. They made me nervous. But besides them, I really wasn't in the bad brains. I wasn't hearing anything, and crowd. <laughs> but that's why and Murphy's Law. But, you know, we, we took the things, you know, we talked about having Jimmy Gestapo be the singer of cro -Mags. We had conversations with him. Um, we had conversations with Robert, Roger Moret. This is all leading up to Age of Coral. You know, one time, you know, I, I, I don't know. We, we, we hadn't been signed yet, but uh, John was in the band. And me and Harley jammed with... Uh, Petey Hines and Roger Moret from Agnostic Front. Petey Hines from Murphy's Law and Roger Moret. It was like a clandestine thing. You know, me and Harley weren't happy with John and Mackie, so we wanted to replace them. And we thought it would be great to do it in one fell swoop, and, and Roger and Petey wanted to, to come and play. So that day, I mean, I had just, literally just written Malfunction. Harley had never seen it. And I knew that like, I really wanted to impress these guys. So I wanted to play, you know, something new and good. And uh, so it came in and I said, I said also when you play with new musicians, you should play something new. You shouldn't just show them something and then them just join in because then you don't really know what they're going to contribute. So, uh, and we had already been playing gigs and everybody knew all the songs we were playing. So. Malfunction was the song we jammed that day and it was me, Petey, Roger and Harley jamming out Malfunction for the first time and like both Roger and Petey were like, oh, this song is so good, it's so different than the other songs, it's like a metal song, it's like Black Sabbath is great, blah, 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 blah. And it was a great jam. And uh, me and Harley were like, I guess this is it, this is what we're gonna do, we're gonna kick Mackie and John out and this will be the, the new Chromex, Roger and, uh, and, uh, <clears throat> And uh, Petey. So uh, I don't know where Harley went. He left. But uh, Roger had a van. And uh, so me, Roger, and Petey got in his van and we drove down to Avenue A and parked because that's what Roger would always do. He always parked his, he parked his van on Avenue A and lived in it with his dogs and his girlfriend. It's really crazy. And uh, so we're sitting in this van that just smelled horrible. You had to roll down the windows. It was just horrible. But I loved Roger. <laughs> So you deal with the peace now. And, uh, and he apologized a lot. Uh, he goes, I said, so, yeah, you know, 
Harley gave me a thumbs up. I think, you know, this is going to be great. We'll move forward like this. And they were both like, no. Oh, that's what it was. I didn't go straight downtown with them. Me and Harley walked downtown and, and I met Roger and Petey down there. He was parked. I got into the van and I was like, so, you know, me and Harley talked about it. It's a long time ago. I got to get it straight. Uh, we talked about it and yeah, we think this will be a great, great plan. And uh, both Roger and Peter are like, yeah, we don't want to join. And I said, really? Why not? He goes, to be honest with you, we don't want to be in a band with Harley. But we love that new song you wrote. So if you'd be willing to quit to start a new band, we want to start a band with you. And to me, I mean, the, uh, there was no appeal to that because I already had a band. And, and, I, and I wouldn't be joining a band. I'd just be taking my songs from one band to another. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I, there was nothing for me to gain. It was like, it was, it was like a lateral move um, with, no, with no benefit except for... Uh, and, and, and at this time, I also got to add that uh, John, Harry Krishna, horseshit hadn't come to light really. He never even mentioned it. He mentioned it to Harley and Harley, you know, and him would like disappear and stuff, but I wasn't hearing anything about it. It wasn't, it was never anything that was brought to the table that I had to agree with or disagree with in terms of it being um, an, uh, an, uh, a part of the band. Um, so I, I didn't see him as a problem except for the fact that I didn't particularly like his voice. Uh, he was a hard worker. He came in and, you know, did his part. But, you know, at the time, I just, I don't know, I wanted something else. And I definitely didn't want Mackie in the band because he was just a pest. But um, so I turned them down. And then not too long later, uh, we got signed and, and made the record. Now, once we got signed and... And, uh, and it seemed like everything was moving in a direction. That's when Harley suddenly revealed that he was a Hare Krishna. And I was like, hmm, okay. And I tried to be sympathetic, you know. You know, Harley was young, and I was young too, but uh, I guess I was a little bit more mature. I, I could at least see that so much of the things that he seemed to embrace were temporary phases as you know adults uh qualify uh the interest of young people uh he certainly went through a million phases um and i just assumed this had to be a phase because you know at that time the only thing anybody ever knew about the christians were they were the people in movies that got knocked down as somebody was rushing through the airport you know and it, as a comic relief and they were the guys with those things on the back of their head and dressed in, in penis color robes. Um, but otherwise, I just couldn't really see that it would be something that would have any lasting value. And I didn't see it being problematic because I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know that it was primarily <clears throat> run by formal, former criminals who basically use it to dupe the public into donating money and things like that. But uh, I learned all those things later. So... <clears throat> As, when Harley became enlisted as a Hare Krishna, that was only when John started to flex a little bit, uh, try to be demanding and impose the Hare Krishna thing, like handing out pamphlets uh, at, our, at our gigs and things of that nature and, and, and talking about it on stage. And it became this kind of thing where if I voiced any opposition to him, Harley would immediately jump in and be his defender. And suddenly it became two against one. So a lot of people ask me like, oh, you know, what did you think about all this? You know, they think I was some kind of willing uh, participant in this whole Hare Krishna thing, but, but it was basically a trick. They, 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 it, was, it was basically um, conquest by occupation. You know, it was a coup d'etat so to speak, 
you know, I spent all these years putting together this band, the hardest fucking rock band I could think of to do. And we took in this guy to be the singer because he seemed like he was a hard guy. You know, he told everybody he was a Navy SEAL, which was a lie. Uh, to, to further this image of, of him being this tough guy. I thought that was great, you know. You know, he, by all outward appearances, he seemed good, you know. But as soon as this Harry Krishna thing started to take over, I realized it became a power thing for him. And since he wasn't really contributing uh, in a significant way musically, it just wasn't a way he could participate into the band. He tried to make the Harry Krishna thing more important. He had convinced Harley that they were somehow missionaries and they had a message and they could use the band to do it. And if Harley and if Paris isn't on board, then, you know, maybe he, he's got to go. And I'm like, ah, no, wait, it's like, you got this wrong. This is not your band. This is my band. But then it became a tug of war between us. And then by the time we made the album, uh, Harley had become completely immersed in this thing, almost more so than John, you know, like Harley's very much the kind of guy who has to outdo everybody, you know, like, Oh, you're a Harry Christian. I'm, I'm more of a Harry Christian than you are. So like he started, he just started trying to out Harry Krishna, John, which caused tension between them, which I loved. But, uh, one day we had recorded the album, the album was about to come out. And, uh, I guess Harley's in Harley's, uh, vie for being more Harry Krishna than John he shows up in robes and the mud on his forehead and he shaves his head and left a little nipple, hair nipple on the back of his head. And uh, he showed up to our record label, arms in the air and running up and down the hallways. This is me, I'm the, this is the real me and I'm uh, Harry Krishna and blah, 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 blah. And I am quitting the band to live in the temple. Oh man. And he left. And I, I get all these calls from the record. Like, oh, Harley's quitting. He's joining the temple. Blah, 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 blah. Everybody's in uproar. Everybody's really upset. And by this time, of course, you know, I'm well accustomed to the, you know, the look at me, look at me, you know, stunts. And this was like the ultimate one. But the payoff to it was hysterical because the, the big payoff was like he comes back and he's, says, I've discussed it with the heads of the Hare Krishna temple because he's got that kind of access. And uh, they decided that I could play a much more powerful, important role for the Krishna consciousness movement in the band. So I'm going to stay. But I'm not doing it for you or the music. I'm doing it for Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> he's way more Christian because he's way more Christian than John and John is not making any kind of sacrifice by being in the band because he's just in the band but Harley's making this massive sa sacrifice it was like so much drama it was and comedy and uh, so now the album comes out we go on the road and you just watch the, these two vie for attention and competing to be the most Krishna and they started doing shit like we would pull into a club tour bus and pull into the club, the two of them would jump out of the bus, run to the dressing room and grab the beer, like the band beer. And they would like, if there was a case, they would take out two six packs, pop them open and pour them in, down the drain. Oh man. <laughs> and then me and, Petey would, he, me and Petey would come into the dressing room and be like, what are you doing? And they go, the beer is half ours. So we're going to do with it whatever we want. And they would just pour it out to be dicks. Oh. Now that I could have never anticipated. If I, could, if I had even imagined that with the case, I would have, first of all, not invited John into standing in front of my music. And when I had the opportunity to step aside, that lateral move I certainly would have taken it because John created a wedge between the viable uh, asset of the band, which was mine and Harley's songwriting partnership. And uh, although that didn't really diminish, you know, when me and Harley were face to face playing music, it was only about the music. But when we were not doing that, we were at odds constantly because of this, you know, this thing. John wanted, John wanted to chant Hare Krishna on Age of Quarrel. You know, it's funny, it's funny because a lot of people, you know, like 
those guys talked so much about it and they preached so much about it that they, they gave this impression that the musical content was this Harry Krishna message. But if you listen to Age of Quarrel, there's no message there. If, if there is a message, it's I'll step on your face. You know what I mean? None of that. I didn't allow any of that stuff to come in. That, now, there's a quote or two in, in one or two songs. Like, uh, I think in We Gotta Know, he says, these are the days of the cheaters and the cheated. Mm -hmm. Right? That's, that apparently is a Prabhupada quote. But it could be anybody's quote. There's also Do Unto Others, which is Old Testament Bible. So are we Christians? You know, there's Don't Tread on Me, which is like a old American uh, um, uh, saying, you know, it doesn't make us revolutionaries. Uh, there's, there's several Bible quotes. It's just, you know, they, they quote a lot of people. But that there's none of that message. And there's definitely no chanting. He wanted to chant over a life of my own. At the end, we go. He wanted to go. Some more shit like that. And I was like, no fucking way. And obviously, that never happened. But as time went on, you know, we went on to the. We, 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 it also didn't last that long. This, this, this transition between the 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 casual uh, guy who came in to sing into the band and then uh, converting Harley and then transitioning into this dickhead because he knew he had Har Harley had his back. You know, like they became, they be it became two against the band. And then when they enlisted, then they enlisted Doug into the Harry Christian. Now, then they thought it was three against one. Hmm. But of course, Doug's vote didn't really count for anything. He was just the guy who joined the band at the end. He didn't write anything. The only thing he ever wrote for the band was uh, uh, the main riff for uh, Crush the Demoniac which uh, is an Iron Maiden riff anyway. But yeah, so anyway, so we went out on tour to tour, to, to tour Age of Quarrel, and it, and it was really short. We did, you know, a month with GBH, maybe two months with Motorhead, and we toured Europe, and then it was over. Wow. I mean, it was over for John. You know, we came back to New York, and, you know, like, they, John almost got arrested on the plane on the way back from Europe because he was bullying uh, Doug because Doug <laughs> at the end of the tour apparently or this is the story that our manager Chris Williamson dropped his wallet with the tour money in it that's the story who knows where how they got his wallet whether they lifted it or whatever but at the, at the end of the tour all the tour money was gone and Harley was gone and we finally got it out of Doug that Harley found the wallet, took the money, split it with him. And then Harley just went off into Europe somewhere. And so me, John, Mackey, and Doug are on the plane together. And John is livid. Like, like John is, you know, he, he's got a short fuse. And he's jumping out of his seat and he's jumping on top of Doug and he's strangling him and he's like, I'm going to kill you. Little did he know that Doug was so scared that at some point he went to the bathroom, put the money in a condom, stuck it up his butt because he was afraid John was going to search him and get it. I mean, he told me this later. He was like crying on the wow. plane and, 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 and the, the, this was before they had all those rules about, you know, you can't talk bad to stewardesses and stuff like that. But like he was totally out of control and he was like totally bullying Doug and Doug was, was crying and I'm sitting there and I'm like, I'm like, John, leave him alone. You know, you don't even know he took the money. He took, I know he's got the money. Not in this whole thing. And Chris Williamson, our manager's there. And I already had a conversation with John when I went, I mean, with, uh, with, with Chris Williamson, when I found out that the money was stolen, I sat down with Chris and I said, I don't care. I don't care who has the money. I don't care how you lost it. I'm getting paid. I want my share and you're going to pay me. And he did. Those other guys could have done that too. I don't know why they didn't, but I did. I got paid. So I didn't even give rat's ass. So, uh, we get home and Harley eventually comes back and John, D did one of these things he also did like this whole this, look at me look at me uh th things that they do one of the things that john did was like he would always quit the band right before we went on tour 
in Europe, I quit the band. What are you going to do without me? And then, of course, he would show up, you know, before we go on tour with Motorhead, I quit the band. And of course, he goes on tour. This time when we got back from Europe, he's like, man, fuck you guys, I quit the band. I was like, really, do you? That's, that's really good. So when, when Harley came back, I pressured, me and Harley started rehearsing, we started writing for Best Wishes, and I started pushing him and pushing and pushing him and pushing Petey, even though his vote didn't really count. But I, I was trying to en at least enlist him. I was like, we gotta get John out of this fucking band. Because the Harry Krishna, oh, I mean, it, it went way, way beyond, like even just like not just agreeing with him and like having this conflict with Harley, which was a terrible thing because Harley was my friend and not, he was no longer my friend. But, um, but John was also a, a thief, you know, he would steal. We, we say we were on tour, we would go to some kid's house, we'd play a gig and some kid would be like, oh, I live in this big house, come, you can, you can all have your own bedrooms. And we'd go to some rich person's house and like, we'd all have our own bedrooms. And you know, the next morning we'd all be sitting in the living room, he's like cooking breakfast for us. And like, John's like, stealing stuff. And I'm like, what are you doing? And then he, then he reaches into his bag and he pulls out these Harry Krishna pamphlets. And he puts them in the spot where the things he stole where the things he stole were. And I'm like, what are you doing? He goes, just goes to show how much you don't know. Like, what do I don't know? He goes, when this kid picks up this Harry Krishna pamphlet and reads it, it will increase his calm. I'm helping him. I was like, you're a scumbag thief, and this is just your excuse for stealing shit. And he did this everywhere. And all I kept thinking was, this kid who's a fan, like me. It's like if I went to Rush's house, you know, or Rush came to my house, and I found out that they robbed me. This kid, this kid lives with this shit for the rest of his life. Oh, yeah, I invited those guys over, and they fucking robbed me. Yeah. So that was another thing I wasn't going to have. So there we are back, and pressure, 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 pressure. And I just said to, I just said to Harley, I was like, listen, let's just start rehearsing. We won't call them, and we'll see what happens. So we started writing, 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 writing. And um, one day, John calls me up on the phone. Uh, and I said, hey, John, how's it going? He goes, hey, what's going on? You know, just casual conversation. He goes, so what's going on? You guys been jamming? I said, yeah. I said, as a matter of fact, we've decided to go on with the band without him. He goes, so it's like that. I said, yeah, it's like that. And he goes, all right. And that was it. It was like no big conflict, no big battle. Saw him on the street the next day. It was just the way it was. And then we put out Best Wishes and toured. And Best Wishes outsold Age of Quarrel three to one. And, you know, if we had kept putting out records and didn't break up after Best Wishes and uh, had some kind of normal output and behave normally as a band, I don't think anybody really would have noticed. Mm -hmm. You ever had one of those days when just everything seems to fucking go wrong? Yeah! Well, this next song, it's a little slower. Let's see if we can get all you motherfuckers out here. What the fuck are y'all people doing up there? You're supposed to be down here. Yeah! Let me see. Let me I see that fucking camera.
crazy, man. That uh, it seems, unfortunately, it was so mired in drama. You know, the Cro Mags and and you catching lightning in the bottle with with the Age of Coral and Best Wishes was was a fine album. Uh, I I really enjoyed you know Alpha Omega as well. I and I really loved when you came back to the band after all those years and that 2000 tour I spoke to you about um, with Revenge. I thought Revenge was a really damn good album. I think it really holds itself as well. And it, it was cool to see Harley doing those vocals. Um, with that in mind, you know, we don't hear much from you about this. It's always like we hear Harley's side and John and Mackie's side. What, what do you make of this whole battle over the name thing? And, and, where the where both of these two entities are at right now because i just recently saw last year around spring the chromags john and mackie version and then i know that harley has a new album with the chromags coming out or already has been out in the beginning but what are your thoughts on how that whole mess has just kind of panned out um, well i'll start by saying you know what you said about the lightning in a bottle and all that kind of stuff and, you know to me the the, the whole the band disappearing and dissipating the way it did was just foolishness and, and vanity and stupidity. You know, like I said, John coming into the band and and splitting up the relationship that made the band that was just the beginning of the end. And like it, it may have hobbled along and bounced back and forth um, on the steam of the first album for a while and the steam of the second album for a while, um, but it was just foolishness. And it, it's a real shame. When I came, when I made the Revenge album in 2000, the only way I agreed to do it, uh, me and Harley talked about it, I said, is if we do new music, I don't want to go out and be a retrospective band. I don't want to go play Age of Coral. I want to write new songs and play all those songs and uh, and move on from there. And, you know, start start fresh. I, I even didn't want to call it Chromags. That's why we were uh, we put out an EP as White Devil, and, and we tried to, uh, several other names that um, that we would have stuck with one of them. But we had ended up signing a big deal with uh, with um, Polygram, and then ended up getting dropped like everybody else. It, there was a big major uh, corporate merger, and everybody um, all the bands got dropped. So we were able to get away with our master tapes or I was able to get away with our master tapes and, um, and uh, put them out ourselves and putting them out myself. I decided to return to the name Chromags, um, a trademark that Harley and I owned together. Um, trademark is a, co is a complicated thing. You know, after the band broke up, I really didn't think there was going to be another Chromags. I, I, I I knew I wasn't going to participate in another album because making revenge was, it was um, by anybody's standards a luxury. I mean, we were in the studio for almost nine months. We had so much money to make that record and uh, the luxury to cater to the eccentricities we talked about earlier uh, that Harley exhibits like having to sing naked horse shit like that not writing any songs <clears throat> beforehand just making them up in the studio um just the endless stuff i just knew there would wouldn't be another album where we would have the luxury of making it as well as we made revenge um so a couple of years after i quit the band when the trademark was about to lapse i just put it on my to-do list of like things to do uh, renew trademark Chromex trademark and I just it just wasn't important to me anymore because I knew I wasn't going to do it again and you know and John I knew John had been you know he would come out with Chromex NYC he would play his malfunction he would pop up here you know this is also the transition between everybody became very internet savvy and stuff and at first when John was playing gigs it would happen I wouldn't know about it um but then, you know, as I became more internet savvy, I began finding out about it and I would stop the gigs. It was as simple as sending a copy of the trademark registration to the club. But then I found myself getting into like <clears throat> tug of wars with the clubs. You know, the problem with trademark law is that if John tours as the Cro-Mags, I can't sue John. 
I have to sue the clubs because the clubs are the ones that are advertising the trademark in the papers and the posters and stuff like that. So you're forced to make uh, enemies of all these club promoters who are just, you know, to a large extent, fans who step up and some of them make careers as being promoters, but they're, you know, generally just fans and they don't understand. They don't understand the simplicity of receiving this trademark thing and saying, okay, I guess I can't book this band. They want it to be a battle. Like, who the fuck do you think you are? Well, I'm the trademark owner. That's who I am. Maybe you don't understand that, but that's the way it is. But I find myself making a lot of uh, ignorant enemies. And then I just stopped fighting it because I couldn't make a life of policing this thing that I never intended to, or I didn't think I intended to do anything with in the future. And I didn't really see why I'd have to protect it because I never thought anybody would buy into like a, a fake John Joseph one. And Harley seemed to want to do his Harley's war thing. And um, so I let the trademark lapse and Harley snatched it up. And Harley must have had the trademark for at least eight years during the time that John was touring as cro He could have stopped those shows anytime he wanted, but he just never did it. And I never, never understood it. And and I, and I began to qualify and rationalize the, my disappointment in the fact that he was out there playing because it was embarrassing. You know, it's like the last gig I played with the cro was in front of 120,000 people at a festival in Europe. And John's playing in like little bars opening up for local New York bands. Opening up. cro never opened up. We opened up for Motorhead. But then after that, we were a headliner. It's like, in certain, uh, anyway, it just became an embarrassment. And, um, it only became, it only really got my attention when I heard at some point that John was planning on making a cro record. And it came to my attention because John contacted me. He, we, had, we had a mutual friend named Doug Crosby, who was a UFC judge and a guy from the old hardcore scene. And he contacted me and he said, hey Paris, uh, John wants to talk to you. And I said, why? He goes, he says he wants to apologize to you. Because you got to understand, for years and years and years, John has been telling everybody that would listen that he's going to kick my ass, and if I ever see that motherfucker, you know. But of course, I saw him. We worked out in the same gym. I would see him in the gym all the time. And people that he knew in the gym would be like, oh, look, there's Paris. John, there's Paris. And then John would like pretend like he didn't see me and leave. It was just like a joke. But anyway, uh, as a, to, to, to annoy him, whenever I would see him at a club or a concert, he, he was hanging out with all his boys, I'd walk right up and be like, hey, John, how's it going? And he would just stand there and look at my hand. But I wanted to show all of his friends that he wasn't going to do shit. And he didn't. So anyway, but I did that just to urge him. But it was still, you know, kind of lame. Like, why can't you shake my hand? We, we share this mutual past. We should both be proud. Shake my hand and say, hey, it's like, good to see you. But he couldn't do that. So anyway... Um, I go meet John. It's in a coffee shop. Me, Doug, and John were sitting there. And immediately John looks me right in the eye, which is very unusual because he has eye contact issues. And he says, I would like to apologize to you for the way I behaved towards you for a long time. And I was, and I looked at Doug and Doug looked at me and I said, wow, well, okay, fair enough. And we shook hands, you know. It's a lot to let go, you know, the fact that he destroyed my band. But to me, I just saw it as kind of like a ceasefire. You know, it's all in the past. Let's just shake hands and at least be normal to each other. People, you know, we were in a club. It, it, at the very least, fans shouldn't be seeing us like bigger. Yeah. You know, they, they should see us shake hands and be like, oh, that's awesome. They're pals or whatever. You know, like, that's important to some people. But anyway, so... <clears throat> Yeah, it was, you know, like a, a very, you know, prepackaged, nonspecific uh, apology, which I accepted. I was happy to accept it because I just wanted, I just didn't care that much, to be honest with you. He doesn't mean that much to me. He was a guy I played in a band with 20 years before and who I have no interaction with except for like snotty looks when I see him in club. Oh, fuck up. But um, so um, he's... He, my friend Doug goes, well, since it's all good, I guess I'll leave you guys alone to talk. So we, we, my friend Doug wasn't gone for one minute before John said, so, and his vested interests come out. He says, uh, he goes, you know, 
these guys I play with, and I go, you mean the Chromax? <laughs> I mean, I said it out of sarcasm. He goes, yeah, yeah. He goes, yeah, none of those guys, they don't really write songs. Oh, I, said, well, I said, well, that's because they're not the Chromax. And even if they did write songs, they wouldn't be Chromax songs. And he goes, yeah, 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 I got you. He goes, but what I was thinking, you know, I would really like to make a new Chromax album. He goes, and man, I tell you, man, what better revenge would, could you ever get than to make a record without Harley? And I looked at him and I said, how little we know each other. I have no interest in revenge. I have no, I don't want to spite Harley. I said, if, if I ever considered playing, uh, returning to the Chromex, which I'm not saying I would, uh, I would only do it if Harley participated in it, and I wouldn't really care if you participated in it. And I certainly wouldn't do it if Mackie participated in it. Um, uh, if you're asking me to write, you know, he went on to say he wanted me to write songs for now, and I said, if I were to, I'm not, I said, I'm just the kind of person who never just says no, I'll think something through, and uh, I'll even discuss it. And one of the things that I'll say right away is that, um, First thing you would have to do if you wanted me to participate is you would have to go publicly uh, in interviews uh, often and tell people that you lied about the fact that I ratted you out to the military. I don't know if you know about this, but there was this whole story about how John told anybody who would listen for 10 years that I ratted him out to the military police because he was AWOL from the Navy because he was a Navy SEAL, which is the story he ran for years and years and years. In the early days of the Chromax, any conversation, any interview, anybody ever asked him anything, he would tell people about how he was a Navy SEAL and how he went AWOL and all this other stuff, and uh, which is not true. So um, I said you would have to publicly shout to the roof and tell people that I didn't report you to the military police. Uh, Cause it also, there was this whole thing in New York where like, um, what, what I think what happened was John, this is exact for anybody who's interested. I'll tell the story exactly how it happened. John was being very, very hostile towards me. And one day I was jogging down the street and he came running up behind me like, motherfucker, I see you. And I stopped, and he had just put out the album, um, Both Worlds album. It had just come out, and I had heard it. And I, I looked at him, and I was like, oh, John's good. I wanted to see you. I wanted to thank you. He goes, for what? I said, I said for putting out that Both Worlds album. It's, it's mediocre. I said, and, and now, before this, all anybody ever judged you on was Age of War. And... Now you've showed them who you really are as a musician. And I wanted to thank you for that. You're the mother not motherfucker. I'll fuck you up. He goes, I'm not even going to do it myself. I'm going to have somebody come and break your fucking hands. You're, gonna, you're not even going to see it coming. Someone's going to show up and they're going to hold you down and break your hands. I said, all right. Well, nice seeing you, John. And I continued on my jog. And I jogged straight to the fifth precinct. And I walked in and I asked to see a detective and I said, uh, I said, listen, I don't know how this, this kind of thing goes. And I'm not particularly worried about this guy, but this is what happened. I told him the whole story about how he said the guy was, was going to enlist some people to jump me and break my hands and all this kind of stuff. And I said, what I would like is for you to write it down. So if somebody jumps me and breaks my hands and I say, it was that guy, you know, we're not, you know, people aren't going to say, oh, you're just making this up or whatever. I just want a paper trail. He goes, oh, we can make a paper trail. He goes, but you're going to have to file a complaint. I said, what kind of complaint? He said, a harassment complaint. I said, well, is him telling me he's going to break my hands in the street? Uh, um, oh, what am I, this is really funny. I, how did I forget this? As I was on my way to the precinct, I ran into Harley and I told Harley about what had just happened. 
And he's like, where are you going? I was like, I'm going to go to the precinct and lay this paper trail. So me and Harley are sitting there across this detective. His name was Detective Pagan. I remember, like Pagan. And, uh, and he says, uh, and uh, so we're sitting there. And I said, well, I said, he goes, harassment complaint. I said, well, what would I have to do to make a harass? Is, is just telling me he's going to, you know, someone's going to break my hand sometime in the distant future. <laughs> Enough for that. He goes, no, you have to have like a, recording or someone would have to witness it or something like that. I was like, well, I don't have anything like that. And Harley looks right at Detective Bacon and he goes, he's AWOL from the Navy. And I look at, I look at Harley like, what are you doing? That's not what we're doing here. And I was in shock because like that was kind of like, you know, John's a dickhead and all that kind of stuff. And it's just something you wouldn't do. And uh, the cop, Detective Bagan looks at us and goes, he goes, that doesn't matter anyway. And I go, oh, really? Why not? He said, because that's a whole separate thing. We don't deal with Navy crimes. He goes, even if he is a wolf in the Navy, it's like nothing we can do about it. I said, oh, okay. Well, next subject. He goes, but we can, you know, if you have like any nasty voicemails from him or anything. And I said, oh, as a matter of fact, I do. I said, I have a voicemail where... He calls my mother's house. John Joseph calls my mother's house because he doesn't have my phone number. He calls my mother's house. He's like, you motherfucker, I'm going to kill you, you motherfucker, motherfucker. On my mother's answering machine. Oh, man. Low, low class dude. And I said, and I think it's still on the tape. He goes, well, go get that tape and bring it back to me. So I go to my mom's house, pop out the tape, take it back, put it in the tape recorder for Detective Pagan. And, uh, play it. It's like, you motherfucker. <laughs> the same thing. <laughs> and, the, and the detective looks at me and goes, this guy is a friend of yours? I said, you might call him former business associate. He goes, all right. He goes, well, this is enough to put this scale in jail. I said, oh, in jail. He goes, yeah, we have to put him to the system. I was like, excellent. He said, <laughs> He said, is he the kind of guy, if I call him, he'll come in? Or are we going to have to knock on his door at 5 in the morning? I said, um, I don't know. Why don't you try giving him a call? And he goes, okay. So um, me and Harley leave. Or Harley wasn't with me that time. And uh, I just go about my business, not thinking about it. And uh, about... Two weeks later, I got a call from Detective Pagan. He's like, so, uh, oh wait, it's, this was so long ago. I'm trying to remember how it happened. It's all very funny. Um, oh, he goes, we called John and asked him to come in. And then we've gone by his apartment several times, but he is not there. And apparently he's, no one's seen him in like a week or whatever. And I'm like, really? And so the next thing, you know, I find out I, uh, that John, when he got the call from the detective, he was afraid that he had been ratted out to the military and went down to North Carolina and turned himself in. Wow, that's incredible. So... I tricked him into right. turning himself in right. without even knowing it. Now here's the now here's the, the typical Harry Krishna hustler is apparently he's in the Navy brig and he calls everybody in New York to tell them, oh, uh, Paris and Harley ratted me out to the military, which never happened, technically. Uh, Harley tried to, but he was unsuccessful. Um, it was all about the harassment, but, uh, he called, apparently called everybody in New York, including Jimmy Gestapo, all these people and told everybody that he's in jail <clears throat> in DC, in military prison in Washington, DC, and that he needs bail money. Um, and so Jimmy and all these hardcore people, they throw a big benefit at uh, Coney Island high where all these bands play. <clears throat> bail money for John Joseph. And at the end of the night, they take all the money and they send it to John. And John accepts it. 
I don't know if you know anything about military prison, but they don't have bail. People in military prison don't have the same rights. So, yeah. John tricked all his friends into giving him a bunch of money. <laughs> Paris, I got to tell you, man, these are some fascinating stories and have absolutely lived up to everything that I had wanted to know, needed to know, and probably could still go on to find out, man. Uh, I really want to thank you for taking your time on a Sunday and being as candid as you are and were about, about everything from, from the Chromax early experiences to now. Um, before we do wrap it up, though, I do want to ask you what you are doing now. I know you said at the beginning, and, and I knew this looking at your history on, on Facebook and such, that you're involved in, in the film industry, and you're with, the, what is it, IATSE 600? Is that the, um, uh, the union you're involved with? I, I used to be involved with IATSE 480 here in Albuquerque in, in New Mexico for a brief time. I kind of got out of that for other, because I got into radio, and there's no union in radio, all that stuff. But um, what are you doing? And I, I see you with a bunch of fascinating, I mean, you have this like crazy, you're a renaissance, renaissance man, you got this crazy life that just the wheels keep going. And, you know, I see you with Tony Hawk. I saw some pictures prior uh, with you with uh, Chris Cornell prior to him passing. Uh, you know, talk to us about what you're doing and uh, what movies, what, the, what projects have you been working on right now? Well, you know, when I left the Chromags, it, it, a lot of, you know, you might just assume that I would just go start another band, but I am fortunate to have um, abilities to express myself artistically in multiple ways, and I find myself often just hitching a ride with whatever is appealing to me at the moment. I, maybe a lot like Pete Steele did with influences, uh, but when I came out of the band, it didn't occur to me in the, uh, initially to start another band and I, I just decided to get involved in the film business and I started working as a camera operator. Um, uh, initially I started, I wanted to try directing again because before the band uh, I was directing a lot of music videos and I was a director, that's what I did for a living. But you know, you take off five years to, uh, to play music and when you come back, the thread isn't necessarily always there, but the film business was still there. So I went back as a camera operator and a steady cam operator, and uh, for uh, I joined Local 600, uh, Society of Camera Operators, and I work on movies, uh, television commercials. I did uh, two seasons of The Americans, two seasons of Blue Bloods. Uh, I just did a TV show called Katie Keene. I did big feature films like A Dog's Purpose, uh, Den of Thieves with Gerard Butler. Um, I just did... Uh, uh, Isn't It Romantic with Rebel Wilson as a camera operator. And I'm also now directing again. Me and my wife have started an agency called Wildfire NYC. We just did our first music video for uh, an artist called M. She's from the uh, Philadelphia area. And we just delivered that just before the pandemic. And she's up to like 200,000 views on that video. It's, you know, it's pop music. It's not like anything... Um, along the lines of Chromags, but it's really good. And uh, I, I'm really proud of the video. And Barbara and, Barbara and my wife and I have done uh, three jobs uh, with Wildfire before the pandemic happened. Now, obviously the pandemic shut us down, but when the pandemic is over or levels out or whatever happens to the world, uh, I will continue to uh, work on television shows and, um, and uh, focus more on directing. Very cool, very cool. Lastly, what kind of advice would you give to anybody that uh, starts in a band with you, at, like you at your age? And, you know, looking back at it, what, what one thing could you have done maybe differently that might have set things off a little bit, uh, maybe right the ship a little bit more? I mean, based on what you told me, it's kind of seemed like it was in other people's hands at that point. And you were sort of like, again, I kind of find you sort of, sort of a pragmatist, somebody just kind of got your head on right, you know, and unfortunately we're mired with other people's dysfunction, if you will. Well, it's hard to say, you know, when you're, when you're young and you don't have the wisdom uh, born from experience of knowing uh, the duplicity of people, whether they're hiding it or they just haven't developed into who they could be that you don't want them to be, uh, the attributes that make a, a good partner, very hard to discern when you're a kid. 
um, you know, the, the attributes that appealed to me to, about Harley uh, when we first started playing together was, were a few things. One of them was that he loved my music. That was a tremendous thing. And he embraced it completely. And, um, and when we played together, it was uh, seamless and, and, uh, and, and, and the musical chemistry was immediate and undeniable and uh, delivered us, you know, revenge, best wishes, age of quarrel, and my songwriting uh, wrote most of uh, Alpha Omega. But um, I never took into consideration who Harley was and all the things that had happened to him before I met him. You know, terrible, terrible things that happened to him that did shaped uh, who he is and, and, and his inability to have a relationship. But if I would go back in time and be asked, was I concerned about any of those things? I wouldn't have had the knowledge to know. And I don't even know if I would have forsaken um, all the pros. Uh, I think the pros outweighed the cons when you're dealing with art and music and, and that kind of thing. You just gotta hope it'll last as long as it can. Uh, um, endurance uh, lasting is not something uh, that rock and roll does. So much of it is a, is a, is a shooting star. You just gotta, hope that you can be a part of one while it's exploding and awesome in the sky. And when it's over, just be happy you were part of it. Um, to hope that you'll be part of some lasting thing is, man, it would be great. You know, I, I, I wish there was some kind of enduring uh, uh, legacy to the Chrome Eggs besides mediocre records and, you know, being an opening act. Um, but there's really, the only thing I can say is, you know, from a business point of view, I'm glad I published all the songs on Age of Quarrel myself before we signed with, uh, with uh, Profile Records because I own the publishing for my songs. Um, definitely do that. Uh, own your rights. What that is, is it may seem very ab abstract. Um, if, if and when I do another music project, it will be clear who the source and the owner is. Um, although I say that now <laughs> because I am also very, um, I am uh, attracted to talent and I appreciate it and I am a team player and I like being a part of things. I could do things all by myself, uh, but I also love to be part of a team. I've uh, played with a couple of people over the years where I felt like, I had uh, found something extraordinary again, but for various reasons, they didn't work out. And uh, so I think the first thing I will release uh, soon will be uh, something that is definitely, uh, the source of it is clear and it'll be me, and, but it'll also be an invitation. My first release will be me inviting uh, like-minded, musicians to come and maybe participate and if five records from now uh i have somebody as a partner who i see as a real partner that would be spectacular very nice paris fam i can't thank you enough man this has been not only an honor and a privilege but i'm a huge 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 fan of you and i all you know thank you for for your work with the chromags again i thank you for this interview and your your candor and and uh, you're an inspiration, man. I thank you very, very much. And again, taking the time out through this pandemic, I know it's rough times, taking the time out on a Sunday afternoon like this, man, I couldn't have asked for anything better. I fucking interviewed Paris, man. That's very cool. Thank you very much. Um, one last, last, last thing. Favorite Rush song. I know that's hard to narrow it down, but for me, I'm going to say it's La Via Strongiato. It's very easy for me right there. You know, there might have been a time when I said that too. And there's so many great songs. Hemispheres is by far my favorite Rush album. Yeah, by far. I'd say by far. Uh, Farewell to Kings is a distant second. But um, oddly enough, even though Hemispheres is my favorite record, my favorite song might be Xanadu and, or 
side one of hemispheres, just the whole thing, you know, it's, it's got everything that Rush is and that ending, that acoustic ending with Getty singing, it, it just fantastic. Everything about Rush, I love Rush. I mean, up, you know, up until moving pictures. And, then, right. they broke, and then they broke up and uh, <laughs> never made another record. I don't know why. I like the newer stuff as well. I love it all. The body work's amazing. But once again, thank you very much. Paris Mayhew, co uh, one of two founding members of the Chromax, has joined us right here on the Zero Hour Squared Classics, current classics. This is Mike Trujillo. You have been watching the Zero Hour Squared Classics, and we do appreciate it. Take care, Paris, and be safe. Thank you very much. And as a, this is my sign-off. All right.